are some, a lot of new faces here tonight, actually. My name is Jessica Renahan, and I'm the Visitor Services Supervisor for the Department of Conservation and Recreation. We helped to put on this lecture in coordination with the Friends of the Hull Public Library and the Hull Life Saving Museum. So as many of you know, this lecture takes place monthly, and we cover all sorts of topics from historic lectures to hosting various authors. And tonight's no exception. We have a great lecture planned. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. In celebration of Massachusetts Archaeology Month, tonight we are honored to welcome Victor Mastone. Victor Mastone, oh, yeah. A little applause for our guest speaker. Thank you. Victor holds an MA in Anthropology and an MBA in Arts Administration. He is the Director and Chief Archaeologist of the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources. He is the first and only on his staff of just one. <laughs> he is a member of the Society of Historical Archaeology's UNESCO Committee and of the North American Society for Ocean Oceanic History. Tonight, as we honor Massachusetts' historic past <clears throat> that quite literally has been buried, he will be speaking about his efforts to locate and identify the remnants of the original Minot's life. Please join me in wel welcoming Vic Mastone. I have a few handouts. If you don't get one and you're interested, uh, you can email me and you can get that off some of the handouts in the back, my email address, because I'm really down on business cards. And since we have to buy our own, it'll be a little while. Oh, I don't want to use the microphone because I'm going to move. I don't like to stand in front of the mic. I don't like to use the mic at all. Um, I think I have a fairly loud voice. At least I've been accused of that in the office. And possibly it's the poor acoustics of this room. Anyway, to get started with, um, I really found mine it's like to be a very interesting project. And that's really what I'm talking about. So if you're really here to learn about a lighthouse, you're really going to learn more about the project to find a lighthouse. So I don't want to disappoint our lighthouse enthusiasts, but this isn't a thing about keepers and what kind of lenses it had. It's not about that at all. Uh, it's about a story about the very first Minot's Lighthouse. Now, this is the lighthouse everybody sees today. This is the 1860 lighthouse. It was pretty old, National Register site. Um, it's the I love you lighthouse in the popular jargon because of the 143 light. Uh, however, this, this light was first lit in November 15, 1860, almost a year after the first lighthouse had been lit. And people really don't know that there was a first lighthouse. And here's some views. And when you look at these two images, notice not just the color difference, because it's just probably a, someone had the, the, the ability to make a nice color image, but rather Look at the, the structural changes. Notice here, there's no superstructure underneath the, the cabin. Now we've got another section there for storage. So they've started to increase the size of the lighthouse in, in, in just a short period of time. But I should back up a little bit. Before this lighthouse was built, there was a petition in the 1840s from the merchants of this area, from Situate Cohasset in, in, in Boston, petitioning to have a light put here because 40 vessels had been lost over a short period of time. And that petition led to the construction of this lighthouse. Uh, but we should really think about this in terms of a project. And you have to forgive me because I've, I've done this, this talk many times, but I wanted to change it a little bit and, and tell you a little bit more about the project. I'm not going to read each one of these goals. But this was a joint project between my board and a lot of partners, especially the US Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard has its goals for doing a project, and the state and the archaeological community has its own goals. They're not quite the same, but they overlap, and they allow for us to do, to, to sort of, as you put it in their jargon, take advantage of each other's assets. Assets of the Coast Guard are their boats, and my skills as an archaeologist, and so we kind of trade these to do the project. Uh, but it was also, the catalyst was really nothing to do with what our goals were at the Coast Guard or as me as an archaeologist. It had to do with the foundation of a Coast Guard history. They wanted some recognition to the two keepers that were lost. And we'll talk about them as the story goes on. 
And that really pushed the buttons of everybody to say, let's do this project. Let's get a memorial out to two, two men who died in the performance of their duty. With that being said, this is not from the first mine, it's alleged lighthouse. This is from the second. But I want you to note, this is dead low tide. So for maybe three or four hours a day, for a couple of months each season, so basically spring and fall, they could do some work on the light. So it take, that's why it takes so long to build these lighthouses. But in this case, this lighthouse is built on the spot of the original. It uses the same holes that they drilled to put the iron lighthouse in to make the to anchor this lighthouse to the to the um, to the to the, the uh, submerged rock. It's funny. I tend to think about all the jargon we use. This is a semi-submerged uh, stone outcrop with um, a solid granite. And I can't remember. The Coast Guard had these very particular terms that they had to keep using all the time. Since I'm not working for them, I can, can avoid it. Uh, what I think is interesting is that this, was, this lighthouse was designed by Captain Swift of the topographical engineers, the precursors to the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as the um, geodetic survey, sort of a combo. Ca Captain Swift went to Europe because that's where the technology for lighthouses was coming out of to, to, to work on the design. He looked at one in France, and he was talking to the British lighthouse keepers, and they're going to build Eddy Stone Light, which is a very large offshore semi-submerged stone outcrop. And they were talking about building a skeletal lighthouse. And he got enamored by that idea, thought this was great. He comes back to the States. At the same time in Britain, they decide, this isn't a good idea. We're going to build a solid granite lighthouse. And they scrapped the idea. Swift went ahead. So in about 1847, began the project, took them three years, and on January 1st, 1850, this light was lit. And from the start is a problem. The first keeper, um, I always have to look at the names, Isaac Dunham. Isaac Dunham lasted 10 months, and from day one he complained about the instability of the structure, that it shook all the time, that he felt nervous all the time, that he felt unsafe all the time. So he was relieved. And a cap um, captain, then keeper John Bennett took over. And he was going to be the, shall we say, the last keeper of the first mine it's light. Uh, Bennett found the same problems. He complained in, to, to Washington, to the Lighthouse Service, a lot. To the point um, where he felt his life was in peril many times. They did do some stabilization. So if you notice, and it may be hard for you to see, but there's a cable, and I think this is fictitious. I don't believe that, 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 that they would do that. Um, but there was a stabilizing cable. They also added other cables inside the structure. We get that from some correspondence. There's very few, what comes down, we all think there's lots of plans and engineering drawings out there and all these specs. We, we've got two pieces of information from Captain Swift. One is his diagram when he finished building it. The diagram when he goes after it's crashed, um, is knocked over, and a letter requesting some supplies. That's it. We haven't been able to find anything else. We haven't even been able to find um, information on the salvage. Excuse me. So, before I switch slides, I, I want to read something and to really tell you um, the peril they felt they're in. Now, since they're in a, uh, on this lighthouse and they're separated from land by quite a distance and it's a very unstable area, if you ever sailed out there in a little bit of rough weather or when there's some rollers, it's not a very comfortable place to be. Um, so in March the, of 1851, there's a series of really bad storms. And I'll have the date for this, the, the one that really bothered us, uh, um, the, the keeper the most. But he, he, he put a message in a bottle because he didn't think he was going to make it. But he didn't think they were going to last the night. And he, he, he writes in the, in the bottle, in the message that was found, our situation is perilous. If anything happens before the day dawns on us again, we have no hope of escape. But I shall, if it be God's will, die in the performance of my duty. Noble sentiments. And fortunately, it didn't happen. It stood the night. Fortunate for, for Mr. Bennett. Fortunate for keepers. Antoine and Wilson. So I think he was pretty upset. Went back, and the story, the anal 
um, anecdotal story, because we have no evidence to back this up, is that he came back after that storm and began a new campaign of complaining. About a month later, on April 16th, another heavy storm hits the coast again. So these series of spring storms we've been getting lately are a part of a cycle, and this is not to make any disparaging comments on climate change, but rather there's a cycle in nature. There was a cycle in the 1850s of some really horrific storms. And, and the, it was, um, it's such a state again, she breaks. However, the assistant keepers, while well, Bennett was unsure, his assistant keepers were at their station. On the 16th, they wrote a note and threw, put this in a bottle. The lighthouse won't stand over tonight. She sinks two feet each way now. That's the message. That's what's thrown in the bottle. That's all we know. The next morning, I should say this to back the story up, at about, people could see it before midnight. At 1 a.m. on the morning of the 17th of April, they could hear the last foghorn blast. And after that, they heard nothing. Next morning, they come back. And there's not much visible. That's what was seen. And several months later, it was visited by Captain Swift, who made this diagram. And I, what we recently came across was this notice to mariners talking about the fact that the lighthouse had toppled and that they have a light ship in station. One of the anecdotal stories that was given to me was that Captain Bennett, the irony was that he was put on a light ship stationed at Minots. I can find no record of that. The, the, the light, light ship captains were two other gentlemen, not, um, not Keeper Bennett. Uh, they, were, they were older light ships. One was called the LVN, which when you get a letter signification for um, a light ship, it's a very early build, probably in the 1820s, 1840s, which in 1860, 1850, this doesn't sound so old, but Light ships take a beating. They usually sit in a really rough station. And then she was replaced by the LB-7, which did diamond reef, but it actually did a couple of other uh, stations in Massachusetts before she was there. Both vessels were sold out of service. They weren't um, wrecked in service. Uh, that would have been more ironic. So we, we started to think about it. Is there any remains of the lighthouse? We had heard that it had been salvaged. We heard that it had gone to... Um, uh, 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 a nail maker had salvaged this, but there were no records. And the Revenue Service is quite meticulous in its record keeping, so that, those records have to be somewhere to find out what was salved, how much it was valued at. But in any event, I started talking to some fr friends of mine that dived the area a lot, and talked about this project, and they had materials that they had found on the site. And they had collected these over the years. And they were pretty interesting pieces. Um, uh, a, brass w a bronze wedge, some Fresnel lens pieces, some glass plate, uh, a, uh, a soapstone uh, slide, which probably goes to a window. Looked at these and go, hmm, they're lighthouse materials, but they probably, it just didn't fit. And sure enough, as we did a little bit of research, she didn't have, uh, Binance did not have a Fresnel lens. It had a reflector. So we started thinking about the different things we could find. This is the only specs we could get from, from uh, Captain Swift. So we knew that those weren't from that lighthouse. They're from the second lighthouse. So it's interesting the discussions with the Coast Guard historian over this that he says, there's no record of the Fresno lenses being busted at any time. Well, we got pieces. So some little bit of a, I wouldn't say a cover up, but certainly the story needs to be embellished a little bit on the, on the Coast Guard side. And so these are the things we started to think about. What would we find out there? What would be remains that we would encounter? So we, we worked with UMass and, and the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration to do some survey data and uh, some analysis. And at first we figured we'd survey the area of the lighthouse for scatter and look for areas for moorings. We'd heard about several areas where mooring blocks had been found. It would make sense to be off, but they were quite far off the site. But we, we figured it was worth doing some survey work. Uh, we deployed side scan sonar and a magnetometer to see if we could get, identify uh, remains. Uh, and you'll see how fine we can get the data. We surveyed quite a large area. We went as far south as the Delaware. And the wreckage there was quite jumbled. 
But we, we surveyed around. Uh, there's a shrimp boat out here somewhere as well. Or, or it's a fishing boat. But we covered most of the area except for a couple of spots. And you'll see why. Uh, just to give you some of the raw data, this is near the Delaware. And you can see how jagged, I mean, you can't really see it back there, but the very rough surface and an outcropping out there is the equipment, very cramped quarters on a little vessel from the Mass Environmental Police that we used. Um, and this is the data we collected. This is magnetometer data, this is uh, side scan sonar and multi beam sonar data. What's interesting is this is the gap here. For me, is, that's interesting as an archaeologist. Can't get the boat in. We can't get close enough to collect the data we want. Now I'm going to switch sides a little bit to see if I can point out a feature or two. It's, it's, it's really hard. It's, I'm going to have to turn this for a second. It's really hard to see some of the really unique features here. I can see some straight lines, which to me I know are not natural, that are man-made because of their duration. But what I found really interesting here from a geological point of view, got a nice large feature here, and I can't pick out the other one. There's another one in here. You can see ancient earthquake shear faces. So where we had some underwater earthquakes in that area, you can see the, the scars left on the landscape still there. And the data, the, the, sub, the sub bottom, um, the side scan sonar and the multi-beam sonar are so fine they can pick that up. We were really disappointed because when you look at the magnetometer data, if you look at all these high spots, the red, what that actually shows us in 1978 and the great, and the great storm of 1978, when the cable broke, the power cable going out to the electrified Minus Lighthouse, it all wrapped around that rock. And that creates an image for us that we can pick up. But we have a lot of, a lot of hits, but it all coincides with the cable. It was disappointing to us because we figured we have an iron structure. A magnetometer is there to detect iron. And we get this nice copper cable that sends off a magnetic field that just distorts everything. So we couldn't find structure to narrow our search. So now we have to turn to the, the human side, to the diver, to the archaeologist, to get out there and look at this. And the project starts to shift a little bit. And this is when the Coast Guard really gets involved. Now I'll switch back to this side. So with the Coast Guard involved and our other partners, we actually assembled quite a mighty fleet. The great Abbey Burgess, uh, another tender, some private vessels, uh, Cohasset Harbor Master helped us, the Quincy Police have helped us, the Mass Environmental Police were always there for us. Uh, so we, we were able to get a group out there, and this is at high water, so we can get in pretty close to do the diving. But it turns out that Coast Guard divers aren't trained like, and most of them aren't recreational divers. They'll dive for recreation, but they won't dive for shipwrecks. They're used to diving, and they usually are on their backs looking at the bottom of hulls. So we had to train them on how to look for, for remains on the bottom. And they really weren't even good at finding the lobsters, and this is a very popular lobster spot. <laughs> they, they got better as time went on. But we had to train them in, in the use of, of equipment, both dry land, to get them used to what we were interested in and what we thought we would find, and then get them in the water and dive. This was also complicated by the fact that we had to keep the dive team separated because that previous summer there had been a horrific dive accident off the Healy, which is a Coast Guard cutter, the uh, icebreaker in, in the Arctic, and they lost two personnel. And for safety reasons, they kept very strict um, protocols. So we had to be very careful how close we were to divers when we were in the water. I wasn't in the water with them, but our divers had to keep them, maintain a certain distance. Made it very difficult to do training. Also, we want to involve the cadets. And this has been a mission th um, sort of protocol that I've had with the Coast Guard since day one. We're doing another search with them now called the Search for the Bear, which is a, another vessel that sank off of Nova Scotia. And in any event, we try to involve them in projects, as school projects. In this case, they built their own remotely operated vehicle, a tethered submarine, basically. So this is their poster that they did for their class. And this is them testing it. Two cadets got to come up with the environmental police and go out and drop, the, drop the, um, their ROV off. At the same time, the port security officer has a mini ROV, that one, 
and they use that to test it. These aren't designed for archaeological research, but it was a good training operation for these guys to interact with divers, because what probably won't come out in any of the document and goals is the fact that we were testing other equipment with the Coast Guard and having dive teams work with surface vessels, work with ROVs for Homeland Security purposes. And that was a success for us because they were able to coordinate and, um, shall we say, eliminate conflict. But we did some field work and we did find things. Well, first of all, here's a couple of Coast Guard divers at work. This little I call it a arm. It's actually probably as long as my arm with a big um, pin on the end, like a pintle. It's, a, it's, a, it's probably the door hinge from probably the first refit of, of the lighthouse. And probably that soapstone piece that I showed earlier, it probably fits that groove. So it's probably custom built. We did a lot of transects, and what we ended up doing is trying to map in areas that we thought we'd find things or where our, our split divers we've been working with, where they had found material or, or suspected we should find material. So the idea was, here's the lighthouse, where is it gonna fall, how far, let's start to, start to look. So we did some systematic and some random surveys through there. Uh, some of these are errors in um, GPS coordinates. Sometimes even when you have the really good stuff, the collecting errors are there. Uh, but it's, so it's Coast Guard diver recording. This actually was recorded by one of our volunteers, but you get this idea of what's found, what they're trying to look for, what kind of information we want, because it's just a preliminary survey. And we did find things. We found several components. Well, first, let's look at this one. And I'm gonna turn the microphone off again, because I'll get too close to the, to the um, speakers. Is an I-beam. It could just be marine debris. It's certainly not from the first lighthouse, we know that. It's steel, we can tell from the structure. It's probably from one of the refits, or, or, or conversions of the lighthouse, and just left, because at that time, they, they dumped debris. In fact, they were there the year before we went out the survey looking for batteries. Coast Guard used to just, in all these lighthouses, just normal course of business, dump our batteries over, over the side. Now they're going back doing cleanups. So it could have been associated with that. It could just be random junk just dumped on the site. In here, it's hard to see, but there's actually a spokes-like structure in there. We think maybe one of the hubs. So that when she, this, the uh, lighthouse looks like uh, a wagon wheel in a sense in the way at certain levels it's put together. So we think we may have a hub. This looks like an, an elbow, um, like a hanging knee in a ship construction probably one of the supports for the lighthouse quarters because that's the, if you when we look at the chart I mean the chart the plan map that we have we have a sense of this from the images a sense from the uh, couple of lithographs as of what people thought it looked like one of the pipes or legs rather uh, this one's curious because of the seam so it's solid so it lends us to believe that the, how, the, how the casting might have been done, uh, that it's actually two pieces put together and then they fill the cast in. Well, here's the problem. So, so when you don't have sort of people thinking about in terms of, they're thinking about in terms of this is a cool thing to see, let's get a picture of it, I'd be putting something in so we don't have the scale. So when I, I'm looking at an image thinking what's the view screen to me, I can recognize shapes, but I can't tell you, is this a bottom leg, a middle leg, a top leg, a cross piece? Uh, same here, another leg, another piece. They're all solid. So we know that they're not just pipe debris, which would have been what we'd be expecting. It could be that. It could be part of that, because they discard a lot of it. But we do, we're finding material, and it's not all in the same spot. And of course, the other piece of our whole mission was to do the memorial to the lighthouse keepers, uh, uh, Joseph Antoine and Joseph Wilson. I don't know why the names are in reverse order. Usually you go alphabetical, though Wilson may have been in the service longer. Uh, and that's usually what the, the ex-coasties would look at. Uh, Antoine has an, uh, descendants in the area. And I know that through, through some connections. I don't know if Wilson does. We've not talked to the, the descendants. 
But that's sort of what the plaque says. The plaque was put on this sinker, dropped down. We had a memorial service. Um, this Coast Guard officer actually is the state underwater archaeologist for Wisconsin, who for his summer tour of duty, the Coast Guard reassigned him to work with us. So we got the benefit of his experience. He got the benefit of working out here. And of course, the chief in charge of the Abbey Burgess also gave him some on-site training on how to operate the, that buoy tender, which was really good. You get generational um, cross-training. Uh, but the, the, the guys, the, the, the divers were really, from the Coast Guard, were amazing because they volunteered to come out with their time. We had them as far away as San Diego and New York, local. Uh, so it, it really was a nice combination. And these guys typically dove in teams of two and really got together, so it was a good opportunity for them to cross train. And now that unit that they have has been disbanded and they're assigned to do their work differently, but they still have Coast Guard divers. They're just not assigned this way anymore. Oh, and of course, the, this is, to me, the Photoshop that, a shot that anybody would want. The reason I'd want to dive mine, it's, they, they're the only ones that get their picture with the, with the plaque underwater. <laughs> so this is on June 20th. We went back in July, and we couldn't find it. Oh, All right, well, we go back in August, and we can't find it. But we're looking at our first, the first problem in July is like, what, what's wrong with our coordinates? Why are they wrong? Why aren't they, why aren't we right on? Because we have really good di uh, differential GPS, which is military GPS locations. Well, we have the GPS of the bridge of the Abbey Burgess. It has a crane. That crane swings out. And if we don't know what angle she swung out at, <laughs> and drops the sinker. So we've lost 40 to 50 feet in terms of crane swing, as well as vessel swing. Nobody thought about that. We said to Abby Burgess, we want your location, give it to us. He thought, okay, yeah, the bridge, because that's to them what would be important. Me as an archaeologist is, okay, you're the bridge, it's 30 feet to where you're dropping it off, it's how many, what's the you know, orientation of the vessel. So they go down, the second time we go down and we start to do circle searches, and we can't find it. We can't find the sinker. And that's what really bothered us. We found a couple of angular blocks, but we weren't sure they were the sinker. Uh, the divers that came the second time with us was one of my board members, Marcy Belinsky. She hadn't been there for the first, so she hadn't seen the original sinker. Even though we have photographs, you don't really know. And so the rumor started spreading that, oh, oh, this has been stolen. Vandalism, these guys, nobody could be trusted. Uh, and I'm thinking, this, I, I'll, I'll tell you, the rumor mill, when people find anything spectacular, I usually hear about it eventually, but the, it just started to get going, and well, I just have to find my little note page, and I'll tell you that uh, it was found. It was found by two sport divers who were out doing what most sport, oh, I should put this back on, I'm sorry. Uh, they were out doing what most sport divers do at mine and sledge. They go looking for lobsters. And these two gentlemen, and I'm going to find their names because I want to recognize them, um, uh, Dave Smith and Justin. You know, sick. Both are firemen, by the way. So I think that also helped us get it back, um, because you know it's they could see what it was. Um, they they found it in 2011, so it'd been missing for four years before it was found again. What most likely happened when I've examined, we had it in our possession until recently. It's out with uh, one of our contractors trying to figure out how to do a good fitting. I looked at the surfaces of the structure of of the plaque to see if it had been tampered with. And what most likely happened is it, it's, they used the wrong type of fittings, the wrong type of securing bolts. So there was probably an, some kind of electrolytic reaction between the bolt, the plaque, and the ocean, and it disintegrated. And the plaque had not been epoxied. We'd asked the Coast Guard. I said, well, OK, did you epoxy it as well as bolt? Oh, no, you don't need to epoxy this. All you, these bolts will be secure. Well, they weren't. And these gentlemen actually had a habit of cleaning as, as they, they dove. They would pick up debris if they found it. So they saw this little piece of black. It was upside down. And it is corrodes black. Uh, they came back to pick it up as like a piece of rubber mat. And when they realized what they had, it was quite heavy. Brought it to the surface and brought it back in. And that sort of brings us to the, sort of the next stage in our, uh, we, these are just some more shots of the guys going in. And I just want to show that it's pretty poor visibility on certain days, and other days it's beautiful out there. So the days we went, we weren't lucky. 
Uh, now, where are we in the project? Well, we want to reinstall. I'm working with the Bay State Council of Divers, first of all, as a, which is an umbrella um, group of dive clubs. To get, the idea is to give them to work with me to give me uh, support, uh, people to actually go out and dive and do some projects. We're trying to reinstall the plaque. That's our main goal this year. It's been our main goal since 2011, but we, we finally decided we're going to put it on a sinker again. So we're going to work on reinstalling the plaque. Then once that's done, we're going to continue documenting the remains. And the goal here is to create a dive trail. So you go out, you take a, get your picture taken with the plaque, which for a diver, that's a pretty big thing. And I think I'd be thrilled to get my picture taken underwater with something like that. Have a trail so they could see the remains of the lighthouse, learn the story. And that's, that happens in a lot of areas. And thereby give it some recognition, both of the two keepers that were lost, as well as a, a recreational opportunity that's different that we don't have here in this state. So it would be nice to get them out there. It's a very pop. It's also for the guys that fish out there, it's nice to know that there are things there. I, I think it's good to, to learn that story. Uh, so having said that, I, I have a lot of acknowledgments to make. It's a pretty hefty list, and I'm not going to read them all. But I just want to point out at the very bottom, uh, Hank Lynch, Deb Jackson, Tom Malloy, they, they're three people that have been helping me for several years on this project, they, they basically say, take me by the hand and say, okay, here are where the remains are and dive on them for us. They actually went out and buoyed some of them for one of our dives so that we could get the Coast Guard divers on top of them so they could see what the remains really looked like and wouldn't be wasting their time just diving around. Uh, I should also note that um, the Coast Guard threw a lot of it, not just the not just the main Coast Guard, but its reserves, which was our archaeologist from Wisconsin, the auxiliary, the academy, the research and development center, which you wouldn't believe, but they actually helped out on that. They wanted to test gear. And the historian's office, who basically co-sponsored this with me, uh, the Mass Environmental Police, UMass, NOAA, the Quincy, Cohasset, Harbor Master Police, Foundation for Coast Guard History, the Bay State Council, the Situate Historical Society, who um, sponsored us in a grant to work on an exhibit, um, poster exhibit, which hopefully someday we will actually create. Uh, and then a pho photographer Bob Michelson, historian John Galuzzo, and um, dive master Al Anzione, Anzo Suoni, uh, so, um, South Shore Divers, and Jimmy Walker from MWRA. All these people help, and they're, they're all volunteers. And it's been great for me to have such support. With that, I'll take any questions on this project or on anything else to do with the board. Uh, I, I, when we were there, we had very light rollers. We didn't, uh, we, 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 those, the times we were there, we didn't really weren't affected by weather so much. Is it, I think the turbidity that you saw was two days after a rainstorm. We had a heavy rain, and then we went out. Uh, the, when I did the GPS surveying of the, of the site and we did the ROV, um, the remote sensing survey, it actually was pretty flat water. I mean, we were blessed those days that, that we had good, good conditions. I'm curious, what did you actually find? I know you showed us some pictures of a few objects, but if you could sum up what your report would be to the state archive in terms of what you found there and what knowledge it adds to our understanding of that first life. Well, I think for us, it's fine that we found remains. That was our, the goal was to establish the remains. No, I'm going to sort of, it's sort of a two-part answer. So the goal for us is really to establish there was a site. And now the remains, what they tell us is, is not a lot because we don't know exactly, we don't have enough dimensional information on them. We're speculating that they're, the, they're lower section legs or as was just sort of suggested just earlier during my talk by the gentleman in the front, is that they could be the stubs that were removed and just discarded there. What, if they're the stubs, what will help us determine is how did she fail? We know that it's a structural failure. We don't know if the structural failure is due to the reinforcements they put on, because evidently every, they added reinforcing rods to this. It got worse. And they added a reinforcing cable, and it got worse. Was, were they the real cause of, of the structure falling? Uh, so that's sort of what we're trying to get in a long-term research on this. The short term is it just, it's, we know we have, the, the, there's an archaeological site, not just a, a, an architectural site there. 
Uh, hopefully we'll find other remains that will suggest where the keeper's quarters actually hit. You can get a little bit of information out of that, but we haven't established that point yet. The question is, yeah, the question is, how did this lighthouse affect the design of other lighthouses? The, the first light, they did make two other screw, what they call screw auger lights. So not quite the same. They, they screwed it to the sand. So they didn't, it, they showed them it was a problem. The granite lighthouse, again, the, the current lighthouse, the replacement was shown to be a much more stable structure, hence Graves light, which is also the same kind of light. And there's a Graves, third, and I, Graves, I thank you. Uh, Oh, the Portland, the one off of Portland. So you, it, it created a, a set of lights. They knew they could do this. Uh, but it, it was that it basically said, this is not a stable structure. And, and so they switched the, to, uh, to granite. And the granite design seems to be much better. And I think from a hydrodynamic point of view, they thought wa waves would flow through the skeletal structure. But actually what happens is it's the point, it doesn't deflect it at all. It, it grabs at it more, whereas uh, uh, the granite lighthouse, because of its design, tends to deflect the water around it and even up along it, so it's it's much more stable structure. Though I don't know if any of those lighthouse keepers ever complained about um, vibration during the storm. But we have jurisdiction statewide. Uh, for me, the, some of the more interesting things and stuff that people don't see uh, are some of the inland uh, lakes. We're working in Lake Quinsigamond. We have dugout canoes there. They're about the time of the early colonial period, Christian Indians, uh, uh, probably um, 18, uh, 18, 1640 is their rough date. We've got three of them. They're, they're quite interesting, very fragile. We've, we actually had a gentleman want to raise them, thinking, oh, just bring these up. Well, when you take it, there's a lot of responsibility because uh, conservation is very expensive. We have no resources to do conservation. If I'm going to do anything, it's it's, it's begging a favor. When the police go out, that's a favor. When Alan helps me, that's a favor. I'm doing this for Alan. I'm doing this talk partially because Alan does a lot of favors for me. <laughs> so I got to pay her back, and, and she's uh, incapacitated at the moment. But there's that variety. Uh, right now, I'm working on a shipwreck site that's in, in a beach zone, uh, high velocity uh, surf zone. So we're right at zero to negative say one foot tides are when we, we can work it because you don't get we're working it much. But this shipwreck is starting to look like us to be an early shallop. So we're looking at a colonial to Revolutionary War period vessel just from some of the design elements. But we don't see enough of it to tell. But that's, that's kind of cool and to me and we're talking in the 60s, 70s jargon. And it, 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 what's nice is that what I found the most exciting part is when we were digging around what we thought was the bow and we had doubts because when we got behind the bow on the inside of the vessel, there was nothing there, and we'd expected a lot more wood. We, we, as we excavated it, we found draft marks. So we knew that she, we found a Roman six, so we knew the vessel drew at least six feet of water. And we were right at that surface point, so we know there's six feet of boat below where we're working. And this boat is small. It's a 40-foot vessel. But shallops were small. A great shallop was probably 40 foot. So we're kind of getting kind of excited. We might have something colonial. On top of that, as we kind of played around, and sometimes archaeologists do things that we would say to people, you can't do that. I mean, I'll grab stuff out of a site and look at it and put it back. Well, we went down, as we're groping through the sand to feel if we could find the interior hull, we brought out some of the ballast to see if we could find the ballast stone. And they're small. They're all small in football, which is, okay, well, that seems like a lot of work, but all right. We found coral. You don't find coral too often. Coral doesn't grow in the Northeast. <laughs> so it kind of implies maybe trade. Doesn't necessarily mean there was trade, but it implies trade at a, at a great distance. So it, it's kind of cool that way to me. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and there's a lot of other little things, but they're kind of hard to kind of call no. up. And not in the US that we know of. But there are only two other structures like this. And the Coast Guard only can records one other uh, no, I take that back. There are two losses besides this. The only one I can think of right now is in Alaska, and the guardsman who died at their post on that lighthouse, it was sucked out by tsunami. And I don't think it was the 60 earthquake, but it was one of the earthquakes, 50s or 60s, pulled it out, 
basically it, it lifts up, the water lifts up and grab the lighthouse, because no one would expect that they would have been lost in, in service. And I don't count the um, Texas Towers in this sort of category, that's a whole different class of structure for different purpose, really. So I'm, I guess I've been told I'm done, I'm finished, so. Yeah. <laughs>